right in the beginning, uh, when we brought the concept of tight and sexy jeans, we went into the department stores and they said, I'm sorry, we don't need another jeans company. And we were very upset. And we said, I'm going to fix them. We're going to go directly to the consumer and we're going to tell them that we have those beautiful designer jeans. And that's what we did. such a demand uh, that the consumer went directly to the department stores and said, I want that jeans. We talked with advertising and marketing experts in the apparel industry. They fit much better on women than any jeans had before. They were kind of a melding of the fashion world, the practical world, the status world, all at a price that lots of people could afford. It became very acceptable to wear jeans almost anywhere. So it became a universal product, and that added further utility to it because your, your, your jeans were, uh, were, were a product you could work in, you could play in, you could uh, uh, go out at night in. Our brands were built up with a lot of TV hype, and um, it attracted the consumer uh, that this was a new lifestyle and it would give them an image that they didn't have if they wore this jean, so they were willing to pay a premium for it for those reasons. So, how did other producers in the fashion trade react to the early success of the trendsetters in designer jeans? Uh, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Any designer who had a name was putting his name on a, the back pocket of a jean. To keep up the momentum, even more money was poured into advertising, and department stores placed jeans in high-traffic areas. At its heyday, the designer jean industry was spending something on the order of 10% of sales on advertising and promotion. It was really the first time that television had been used so powerfully and so much money spent on television uh, in any kind of fashion, category of fashion that I can think of. Yes, uh, from that point of view, it had to have a uh, big impact on people's consciousness. Do you think you were spending more then on advertising than other companies in your field? Yes, at that time I did. We spent 50% on advertising at that time, and we created that demand. By putting millions of dollars of money into advertising uh, very early on in the designer gene phenomenon, a lot of the entrepreneurial producers were taking a very great risk um, with their finances. They didn't know if the consumer was going to like it as much as they eventually did like it. And if they hadn't, if it hadn't been a success, that advertising money would have put a lot of these companies in virtual bankruptcy. Back in 1965, uh, jeans were bought on the order of one pair, less than one pair per capita, and that increased to almost three uh, per capita. It was a blue denim gold mine, and the only question was how long could you work that vein? The market got overdone uh, when you see a designer jean on everybody's back pocket regardless of their station in life even though the product started at the higher end of the market it worked its way down to the masses and then it lost its status or cachet and then um, the consumer was no longer willing to pay that premium price for it whenever we look back on yesterday's hot fashions we generally ask what did we ever see in that did we really spend our good money on something like that well, times change and tastes change. We asked our economic analyst, Richard Gill, what the changes in tastes and fashions and products might tell us about the nature of supply and demand. A great Greek philosopher once summed up the world in the phrase, all is flux. He could have been talking about the jeans craze, or for that matter, about the American economy generally. We talked a few moments ago about the wonderful law of supply and demand for setting prices. The trouble, as we also suggested, is that these curves never stay put. One year, the demand curve for jeans shoots way up here. A few years later, people tire of jeans or find substitutes in athletic sportswear. Bango.
back down here again. People's tastes change, their incomes change, the availability of other products changes. All such factors can shift the demand curve for any product up and down and back up again. Similarly, on the supply side, when the price of oil zoomed up in the 1970s, for example, that affected the costs of all sorts of industries that used oil as an input. They were faced with an upward shift for their supply curves. On the other hand, businesses are always finding new and cheaper technological devices for producing their products. This tends to shift the supply curve downward. There's a lesson in all this, namely that the law of supply and demand is really more a way of analyzing the deep and underlying forces that affect the prices of commodities than of determining those prices in any rigid way. All is flux in economics, which makes it a field that is sometimes frustrating, always fascinating. The price of the clothes we buy, the fuel we depend on, even the water we use are all influenced by the laws of supply and demand. Of course, the very words supply and demand now sound like a cliché, but the forces behind them remain vital. And the interplay between supply and demand is still at the very heart of our entire market system, a subject we'll be considering in future editions of Economics USA. This is David Schumacher. Economics USA airs Fridays at 9 a.m. on PCN. For a complete listing of all distance learning courses offered by Bloomsburg University, contact the PCN coordinator at 717-389-4420. Visit factories, museums, and other interesting places in Pennsylvania every week on PCN. A PCN tour takes you inside Pennsylvania's industry and history. The tours air on Sundays at 8 p.m. on the Pennsylvania Cable Network. The Pennsylvania Cable Network's daily program schedule is now available by email. To take advantage of this free service, send your email address to PCNTV at PCNTV.com. You're watching PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network, a public service of Pennsylvania Cable Television Companies. PCN is supported by TCI of Pennsylvania, serving cable subscribers in Clarion, Oil City, and State College. really make you want 